Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the online seminar, Optimization. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, Daniel Kuhn from uh, EPFL Lausanne. Daniel Kuhn received uh, his uh, PhD degree in economics from the University of St. Gallen. Before joining EPFL, he was a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Stanford and a faculty member at the Imperial College London. Daniel Kuhn is uh, working uh, on different topics in optimization, in particular in strategic programming, robust optimization, data-driven optimization, uh, decision-making uh, processes optimization. He serves as a editor for uh, important journals in the field, like operation research, but also med programming, NOR. So Daniel, it is uh, our pleasure yeah, to have you with us today. The floor is yours. You have 45, 50 minutes for a talk. Thank you very much, Radu, for the kind introduction. And also, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present in this, uh, this outstanding uh, webinar series. So I will be talking about the general framework for optimal data-driven optimization. And I should say that this is really a talk that is at the interface of optimization and statistics. And uh, this is actually joint work with my postdoc, Tobias Sutra, and with uh, Bart van Paris from MIT. So in this talk, I would like to propose an approach to construct data-driven decisions for stochastic optimization problems that make the best possible use of the available data. And in some sense, we thus seek optimal or efficient estimators for the optimizers and the optimal values of stochastic optimization problems. So I would like to address this challenge within a well-defined framework that is sufficiently general to support the broad spectrum of applications. So the primitives of this framework are a stochastic optimization problem that represents the ground truth against which the estimators will be assessed. Then there is a family of probability measures that capture prior st uh, structural knowledge. And there's a stochastic process that generates training samples. So the stochastic optimization problem minimizes a generic objective function that depends on the probability measure governing the uncertain problem parameters. And uh, examples of such object objective functions include the expected value or some risk measure of an uncertain loss function or the conditional expectation of an uncertain loss function given contextual information or the long run average expected cost of a parametric control policy. Now, the crux of data-driven decision-making is that the probability measure underlying the stochastic optimization problem is not known to us. And throughout this talk, we assume that this probability measure is known, however, to belong to a parametric family. Now, all probability measures, p theta in this family, are defined on the same sample space, and uh, they are parameterized by a finite dimensional parameter of theta that ranges over a convex set capital theta. So I'll call this the model space. So while theta is unknown, we assume that we have access to a finite trajectory of an exogenous stochastic process, which generates training samples that provide statistical information about theta. And again, I'd like to use some examples. So examples of stochastic processes that we can study in this, in this framework include um, processes of independent and identically distributed random variables on a finite state space, finite state Markov chains, uh, different classes of autoregressive processes, or also IID processes with parametric distribution functions, such as normal, exponential, or gamma distributions. However, many other examples are conceivable, and these examples highlight that, in contrast to much of the literature on data-driven optimization, we actually allow the training samples to display serial dependence. Okay, so to make things a bit more concrete, let me first give you an example. A simple example of the general framework. And uh, I would like to look at the classical news vendor problem, which captures the fundamental dilemma faced by the seller of a perishable good. Now, the textbook example of such a seller is a news vendor who sells a daily newspaper, uh, which becomes worthless at the end of the day. So on each day, the news vendor solves the following stochastic optimization problem. So in the morning, um, the news vendor orders X newspapers from the publisher. And admissible order quantities include all integers between uh, one and two. During the day, 
the uncertain daily demand psi is revealed, uh, which is also which also equals an, an integer between one and t. Now, during the day, the news vendor sells newspapers until either the inventory or the demand is exhausted. And that means that the sales quantity is given by the minimum of x and xi. And the expected cost is then given by the formula that I show here on this slide, where um, k represents the wholesale price, which needs to be paid to the publisher. And p um, represents the retail price that the customers have to pay, and it's supposed to be bigger than the wholesale price. Now, the ordering costs are obtained by multiplying the order quantity x with the wholesale price, and from that we subtract the profit from sales, which is obtained by multiplying the sales quantity with the retail price. So here the, the expectation is um, evaluated with respect to the distribution of the uncertain demand. Now, the demand distribution is unknown, but it can be learned from historical demand data. Um, and specifically, we assume to have access to a sequence of historical demands, psi t, that are generated by some stochastic process. So the data generating probability measure that governs the stochastic process is unknown, but it, we assume that belongs to a finitely parameterized family. And, and here, in particular, we assume that under each of these probability measures, the historical demands are independent and identically distributed. And the parameter theta that encodes the probability mass, uh, uh, that the probability measure encodes the probability mass uh, function of the demand. So that is the components of the d-dimensional vector theta, they simply represent the probabilities of the different demand levels. So now without knowing theta, the news vendor must, must decide how many newspapers should be ordered so as to minimize the expected cost solely on the basis of the finite number of training samples available. And then this is a, a simple example of a data-driven decision problem. Okay, so the news vendor thus has no choice but to solve a data-driven surrogate optimization problem that is constructed independently of theta only from the training samples. So now let's return back to the general setting. And recall that ideally you would like to solve the original stochastic optimization problem shown here. Now, this is not possible because theta is, is unobservable. And, and therefore, we must instead solve a surrogate optimization problem. And for example, we could just use a method from statistics to construct an estimator, theta hat t, for the unknown parameter theta. And uh, well, this would be constructed from the training set. So for example, we could use maximum likelihood estimation. This estimator could then just replace the unknown true theta in the objective function. And uh, that would give us a simple surrogate optimization problem. However, there are many other possibilities how we construct um, an optimization problem from the data. So more generally, we could use the training samples directly to construct the objective function uh, C hat t of the surrogate, optimi surrogate optimization problem uh, without the detour of first constructing an estimator for a theta. So there are truly countless ways to construct surrogate optimization problems. And here I just, just list a few of them that came to my mind. So simplest one is possibly the sample average approximation, which evaluates the objective function under the empirical distribution of the training samples. Uh, one could also add a regularization term to this empirical objective function. And the hope would be that the regularization will improve the out-of-sample performance of the resulting optimal decision. An alternative is the predict then optimize approach, which plugs an estimator for theta into the objective function. This is just what I proposed on the slide before. But this estimator could then be trained in view of a standard loss function, such as, such as the mean squared error. But it could also be trained in view of the actual objective uh, of the optimization problem to be, to be uh, solved. One could also try to design a neural network model that approximates the unknown true objective function. Or last but not least, one could use a distributionally robust model. So here one constructs a family of probability distributions under which the observed training samples or all are sufficiently likely. And then one would evaluate the um, objective function under the worst of these distributions. Uh, and, and again, there are numerous ways to construct these distribution families from the, from the data. Okay, so. In the remainder of the talk, I would like to use the following terminology. So the objective function of the surrogate optimization problem will be called a data-driven predictor, 
because it predicts the risk of any fixed decision X in view of the T training samples. Now, clearly the data-driven predictor uniquely defines the surrogate optimization problem. Any minimizer of the surrogate optimization problem will be referred to as a data-driven prescriptor because it prescribes a certain decision in view of the, the training samples. And at this point, I'd like to emphasize that the concept of a data-driven prescriptor is extremely general. Uh, in fact, any function that maps the training samples to a feasible decision can be represented as the minimizer of, of some data-driven predictor. Uh, our aim is to construct data-driven predictors and prescriptors now in, in some sense in an, in an optimal way. So to compare different predictors and prescriptors, I would like to use the following performance measures. The first one is the in-sample risk, which is defined as the optimal value of the surrogate optimization problem. That is, it's just the objective function evaluated at, at a minimizer. And this is a function of the training samples alone and therefore accessible to the decision maker. Second um, is the, the out of sample risk, uh, which is defined as the true risk of the data driven prescriptor x hat t under the probability measure encoded by theta. So this is the actual quantity of interest, but unfortunately it is unavailable, unavailable to the decision maker because a theta is not observable. So at this point, you should know that any prescriptor x hat t may be induced by many different data-driven predictors c hat t. And therefore, our definition of the in-sample risk depends on the particular choice of c hat t. Uh, in particular, uh, c hat t could just be shifted by a constant without affecting the optimizer x hat t, right? So, so minimizing the in-sample risk instead of the out-of-sample risk is quite nonsensical unless we restrict the choice of C hat T. Um, and to this end, um, I'd like to propose the so-called out of sample disappointment of X hat T under P theta. And I define it as the probability that the out of sample risk strictly exceeds the in sample risk of X hat T. So this means that if the out of sample disappointment is high, then the predicted risk of x hat t is likely to underestimate the true risk. And this would lull the, the decision maker into a false sense of security and invariably lead to disappointment in out of sample tests. So again, the, the out of sample disappointment is inaccessible to the decision maker because it depends on the unknown parameter theta. This is a, this is a problem. But now, ideally, we would like all three performance measures to be as small as possible. So, and at this point, it's important to notice that the in-sample risk and the out-of-sample disappointment are subject to a fundamental trade-off. Reducing the in-sample risk, for example, by adding a negative constant to the data-driven predictor C hat T, increases the out-of-sample disappointment and vice versa. And this means that minimizing both the in-sample risk and the out-of-sample disappointment should be expected to be difficult. Um, okay, let us first return to the data-driven news vendor problem from before and investigate the performance of different data-driven predictors and prescriptors. So in this uh, numerical experiment, I assume that the demand is uniformly distributed under unknown true probability measure. Now on the left chart, um, and the, on the left and the middle charts, actually, I would like to show the out of sample disappointment and the in sample risk as a function of the sample size t. On the right chart, on the other hand, I would like to visualize the trade off between the out of sample disappointment and the in sample risk. So in this chart, um, every data driven predictor is represented by a point in the plane, and the x coordinate represents the exponential decay rate of the out of sample disappointment with the sample size. And on the y coordinate represents the asymptotic in sample risk. So let's first look at uh, the sample average approximation model, the SAA model. Uh, here, the data driven predictor evaluates the expected cost under the empirical um, probability mass function corresponding to the three t training samples, uh, which is denoted by theta hat t. So in, uh, in this case, the out of sample disappointment does not get small, but it actually converges to one half. And this is just one can show that this must happen because of the central limit theorem. 
The incident risk is relatively low and saturates quickly as the sample size T grows. And the SAA predictor is represented as the brown dot in the right chart. And uh, you can see from this that the decay rate of its outer sample with disappointment is actually zero. That's clear, right? Because the outer sample disappointment remains constant with T. Now, as a naive remedy, so to ensure that the outer sample disappointment actually decays with T, we could add a positive bias term R to the SAA objective. The corresponding conservative predictors are visualized by the dashed brown line in the, in the right chart. So for R equals zero, we recovered the normal SEA model and as R grows, then the decay rate of the outer sample disappointment grows. That is, the outer sample, sample disappointment now actually converges to zero at an exponential rate. Uh, but that comes at the expense of a higher in sample risk. Okay. So next, let's consider a distributionally robust model where the predictor evaluates the worst case expected cost over all distributions theta in a moment ambiguity set. And um, here, the first four moments of theta are supposed to coincide with the first four moments of the empirical distribution theta at t up to a tolerance r. So the bigger r, the larger the ambiguity set, and so the more conservative we are. And uh, now, for a particular small choice of R, um, I, uh, we see here that the outer sample disappointment decays approximately at the rate of 2%, that's on the left-hand side, and that its in-sample risk saturates at about minus 7. So if I make the R a bit bigger in the same model, then the outer sample disappointment decays faster at the rate of about 5%, and the in-sample risk increases to minus 7.5. Um, So this model is, is, is the one that's, yeah, that's the, the light blue one here. And for an even larger R in dark blue, the outer sample disappointment decays now at, the, at an even fast rate, about 7%, and the in-sample disappointment, uh, the in-sample cost um, is, is even higher at minus six. Okay. So as R is, is swept from zero to infinity, the DRO models with the moment ambiguity set trace out the dashed blue line on the right chart. And again, the higher the decay rate of the outer sample disappointment, the higher the in sample risk. So there's a trade off between these two quantities. So, as a, as a fourth model, let's look at the DRO model, distribution robust model with a Wasserstein ambiguity set. So, this ambiguity set contains all probability distributions within a Wasserstein distance of at most R from the empirical distribution. Uh, for a particular choice of the radius r, we obtain a predictor here in, in orange, uh, whose out of sample disappointment decays as fast as the dark blue DRO predictor with the moment ambiguity set, but at a significantly lower in-sample risk. And if in this case, again, we sweep r, the Wasserstein DRO models, they trace out the orange dashed line on the right chart. And interestingly, they dominate all other models in the sense that they have a lower in-sample risk for any given level of outer sample disappointment. But again, for R equals zero, then the Wasserstein zero model simplifies to the SAA model because the ambiguity set shrinks to the empirical distribution. Okay, as a last model, number five, uh, let's look at the DRO model with the kullback libor divergence ambiguity set. And this ambiguity set just contains all the mark distributions that have a KL that distance of at most R from the empirical distribution. So for a particular choice of R, we visualize here in red the performance of this model. And uh, again, we can sweep R and then the KL divergence DRO models, they trace out the red dashed line in the right chart. So they dominate actually a lot of models in the sense that they have the, the lower in-sample risk for any given level of out of sample disappointment. And again, for R equals zero, zero the KL DRO model simplifies to the SEA model. So, so this example shows that different data-driven predictors, they can display substantially different performance. And it is also remarkable that um, for all predictors considered, the outer sample disappointment in the left chart is almost the perfect linear function of the sample size on a log scale. And uh, this exponential decay rate therefore captures the, the outer sample disappointment extremely well. Okay, so let me now explain how I, how we propose to, or how we could go about to construct surrogate optimization models that are optimal in a statistical sense. So the ideal goal would be to find a data-driven prescriptor that has minimal out of sample risk. Now, of course, the out of sample risk of any data-driven prescriptor is necessarily higher than the theoretical minimum, that is 
the, the minimum of the true stochastic optimization problem. On the other hand, um, we propose to focus on prescriptors that have a small out of sample disappointment. And this means that their in sample risk exceeds their out of sample risk with a high probability. So the expected in sample risk will therefore also be above the out of sample risk. Now, let us try to construct um, uh, data driven predictors that have an in sample risk that is as small as possible. If we achieve that, then and we maintain the uh, out of sample disappointment at small, then we will implicitly push down also the out of sample risk, which is the actual uh, objective we would like to achieve. Now, there is a, a, a caveat here, and that is that in practice, the out of sample risk can be quite different for different values of the unknown parameter theta. Uh, in fact, the out of uh, sample risk is, 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 uh, is even a function of theta, but there are infinitely many theta values, so you can visualize it as this continuous function shown here in red. And uh, the minimum of the true stochastic optimization problem also depends on theta. Now, also, the, the expected in sample risk depends on theta um, because uh, theta encodes the probability measure under which the expectation is evaluated. So, as we do not know the true theta, we might now try to construct data driven predictors and prescriptors with a low in sample risk under every theta while maintaining the small out of sample disappointment again under every theta. Uh, graphically, this means we try to push down the uh, expected in sample risk for every theta while maintaining a small in sample uh, out of sample disappointment under every theta. So we implicitly minimize the out of sample risk under every theta and therefore in particular also under the unknown true theta. Okay, so this reasoning motivates us to formulate an optimization model for finding the best possible surrogate optimization model. The decisions in this problem are the data driven predictors and descriptors, and these are functions of the t training samples. So, this is actually a functional optimization problem. The problem also has multiple objective functions. Indeed, the goal is to minimize the asymptotic uh, expected in sample risk simultaneously for all possible models theta. So, there are infinitely many objective functions. And uh, the constraints here actually they ensure that the out of sample disappointment should be small. In particular, they in ensure that the out of sample disappointment should decay at the prescribed rate r under every possible model theta. So indeed, if you multiply both sides of the constraints by t here, and you just ignore the limb soup for, for, the, uh, for the moment, and then if you exponentiate both of both sides, then you will see that the constraint requires the out of sample disappointment to, to decay as e to the minus rt asymptotically for large sample sizes t. Okay. So now in multi-objective optimization models, it is usually not possible to minimize all objective functions simultaneously. For example, if we minimize the objective function corresponding to theta one here on the left-hand side, then it may well happen that we end up deteriorating the objective function for a theta six. So we should be very lucky to find a Pareto dominant predictor uh, here visualized by c hat star t, and that would be a predictor that minimizes the object, all objective functions simultaneously. So if we can find such a predominant dominant predictor, then we know that it attains the best possible trade-off between in-sample risk and out-of-sample disappointment under every possible theta, and therefore in particular under the unknown true model. So as every predictor encodes a surrogate optimization problem, the optimization problem here over predictors and prescriptors can in fact be viewed as an optimization problem over optimization problems. So uh, this is the reason why we call it a meta optimization problem. And uh, actually this problem I will show to you has a number of strengths. And one of them is that is, uh, well, it is a proxy for optimizing the out of sample risk that I've shown to you before. It also errs on the side of caution. So we, we take um, a robust approach basically. We, uh, uh, we want to ensure certain guarantees. So the constraints here enforce that the out of sample disappointment decays at the prescribed rate r. The most uh, striking uh, property of this model is actually that it does admit the Pareto dominant solution that we can even find in closed form. So I would like to show to you that later. And it also facilitates a separation of estimation and optimization, which is a nice uh, property. 
There are also some weaknesses. So one of them is that the performance criteria, the asymptote, the in-sample risk and the uh, decay rate of the out of sample disappointment, these are asymptotic. So uh, another one is that the choice of this decay rate R is subjective. So that's a hyperparameter that the decision maker needs to specify. And it represents sort of the, uh, the risk tolerance of the decision maker. On the other hand, of course, unlike other hyperparameters that are that come up in optimization, this one has a precise physical meaning. It is the decay rate of the out of sample disappointment of this probability that we, should, we see here. So we know what it actually means. You could ask why insist on an exponential decay rate, right? I mean, uh, why not uh, have some, some other possible decay? That's something we may discuss later. And uh, I should also mention that the optimal models, they will actually not be unbiased, they will be biased estimators for your respective quantities in the original problem. So these are some weaknesses. But let's, um, so, I mean, let's, let's look at this model, let's study it. So before I would like to solve the full-blown meta-optimization problem, I would like to study a simpler version of this problem. And in fact, data-driven predictors and prescriptors are essentially arbitrary functions of the available T training samples. Now, processing or even storing such functions might be easily uh, might easily become very impractical for large T. And the natural approach to simplify the proposed meta optimization problem would be to compress the observation history of the training samples into a summary statistic theta hat T that has constant dimension. Okay, so if you do this, then we may restrict attention to compressed data driven predictors and prescriptors. So these are predictors and prescriptors that depend on the training samples only indirectly through this uh, summary statistic. And they do not get more complicated if T increases. Now, then we can formulate the corresponding restricted meta optimization problem that only optimizes over these restricted predictors and prescriptors. And the hope is that it is easier to handle than the full blown meta optimization problem that we introduced before. So I would like to argue now that this restricted meta optimization problem does admit the Pareto dominant solution if the statistic theta hat t that we're using here satisfies a large deviation principle. Okay, so now here's the definition. So, if, in case you haven't heard about large deviation principle, I haven't uh, for, for a long uh, time. So, so, we say that um, an estimator theta hat t or a general statistic theta hat t satisfies a large deviation principle if there exists a rate function denoted by i such that the two inequalities shown on this slide here hold for every possible Borel set of the parameter space theta. The rate function here should be interpreted as a distance function that quanti quantifies the discrepancy between any real realization theta prime of the statistic theta at t and any model theta. So the left-hand side of the two inequalities here on this slide, they uh, essentially represent the exponential decay rate of the event that the statistic theta hat t falls into the Borel, Borel set d. The first inequality therefore states that the, uh, this decay rate should be at least as large as the i distance, so the distance between the, with respect to the, uh, the rate function i, between theta and the closure of the set d. And the second inequality states that this decay rate should be at most as large as the i distance between theta and the interior of the set d. Okay, so that's all a bit, bit abstract. So let's look at, the, at an example. So here is a visualization of a large uh, deviation principle um, where the probability simplex here visualizes all possible realizations of the statistic theta as t. So here actually, you may, may imagine that this statistic represents the empirical demands distribution in the news vendor model when there are only three possible demand levels. The red dot in the simplex um, represents the true demand distribution. Now we're interested in computing the probability that the empirical demand distribution falls into the yellow set D. So if D does not contain the true theta, so if the red dot is outside of the yellow set, then the probability of D will converge to zero as the sample size T grows. And this is a simple consequence of the, the law of large numbers. Uh, which, which guarantees that the empirical distribution converges almost surely to the true theta. If the empirical demand distribution satisfies the large deviation principle, however, then we have additional information. So we know that um, the probability of the yellow set converges to zero, but we, we actually know that it will decay at an exponential rate r, and the rate r is exactly equal 
to the distance between theta, the red dot, and d, the yellow set, with respect to the rate function i of the uh, large deviation principle. OK, so that's the intuition. Now, um, I'm finally ready to state our first main result here. And uh, here, let's assume that the statistic theta at t does satisfy a large deviation principle and that the corresponding rate function satisfies certain regularity conditions that I would not like to, to detail here. So in this case, we can prove that the restricted meta-optimization problem, which optimizes only over compressed predictors and prescriptors, has a Pareto dominant solution. And the optimal compressed predictor is given by the formula shown here. And uh, actually, remarkably, it has a distribution robust interpretation. So in fact, it evaluates the worst case objective over all models theta in some ambiguity sense that is determined by the rate function i of the large deviation principle. So this means that the optimal surrogate optimization problem is a distribution robust optimization problem. And uh, more precisely, the ambiguity set can be viewed as a ball around the statistic theta hat t, where the distances are measured with respect to the, the rate function i. The radius of this ball coincides exactly with the upper bound r on the decay rate of the out of sample disappointment, which we specified in the meta optimization problem, so which captured our risk tolerance. Okay. So, that was the, the restricted setting. Now let's return to the full-blown original meta-optimization problem. And actually, um, let's specifically um, here look at a situation where we'd like to identify conditions under which any decision-relevant information that is contained in the raw data, so in the training samples, psi 1 up to psi t, is also contained in the summary statistic theta hat t. And if you could identify such situations, then this would mean that the original and the restricted meta optimization problems, they would become equivalent. So the possibility of lossless compression of data into a statistic is in intimately related to the existence of a sufficient statistic. So here is a defini the definition of a sufficient statistic. So actually, theta has t is a sufficient statistic for the, the model theta if the distribution of the samples psi 1 up to psi t conditional on uh, a particular realization theta prime of our statistic is independent of theta. So intuitively speaking, uh, this means that if you have access to a sufficient statistic theta at t, then you would not pay anything for gaining access to the full raw data. Actually, any useful information about theta that is contained in the raw data is already contained in the sufficient statistic. OK? So uh, now I'm ready to state our second main theorem. And uh, to this end, let's assume that the statistic theta hat t, so that we can find some statistic theta hat t that is sufficient for theta, and that satisfies the large deviation principle with a, with a a rate function that satisfies certain regularity conditions again, so mild conditions. In this case, we can again prove that the original full-blown meta-optimization problem has a Pareto dominant solution. And the optimal data-driven predictor is the same distribution robust optimization uh, model that was already optimal in the restricted meta-optimization problem. So the difference here is, of course, that before we optimized only over restricted um, uh, predict, um, compressed predictors and prescriptors. And now we can actually prove that our DRO model here is optimal within a much, much larger class, the class of all data-driven predictors and prescriptors that depend on the data in essentially an arbitrary way. OK, so and actually this result also establishes um, the separation principle, a principle of separation between um, estimation and optimization. So in the sense that to determine an optimal data-driven uh, decision or an optimal data-driven prescriptor, what we should do is we should execute uh, the following two steps. So if we should first evaluate um, the estimator theta hat t, which needs to be a sufficient statistic and needs to satisfy an LDP, and then uh, we can solve a distribution robust optimization problem with an ambiguity set that is centered at this theta hat t. Okay. 
So now I would like to describe several data generating processes for which the restricted meta optimization problem, or, or even the, the full blown original meta optimization problem, admit indeed Pareto dominant solutions. And uh, it should be no surprise that the first example is again the context of new vendor problem, so where we have access to IID uh, demand observations, and uh, these adopt integer values between 1 and d, as you remember. And here the empirical distribution is given by just a d-dimensional vector, of course, and the i-th component of this vector simply records the empirical frequency of the i demand level. So because of the fischer neiman factorization theorem, um, we actually know that this empirical distribution is a sufficient statistic for theta. So that's a simple exercise to show. And on top of that, there is uh, something called Sanoff's theorem, which tells us that the empirical distribution satisfies also a large deviation principle. And in fact, the underlying rate function is exactly given by the kullback libor divergence. So what does it mean here? So this means that our theorem 2 applies. Um, and it means that the distribution robust predictor that has a kullback libor ambiguity set centered at the empirical demand distribution that uh, this model represents a create a dominant solution for our, for our meta optimization problem. So it contains the best possible trade off between in sample risk and out sample disappointment under every theta, in particular under the unknown true theta. So this is actually consistent with the simulation results that we have seen earlier, where the distribution robust predictor with a KL ambiguity set outperformed all other tested predictors. Um, so, uh, so in the sense that it offered a smaller in-sample uh, risk than all other tested predictors for any fixed level of the out of sample disappointment. So our theorem two actually tells us now that no other predictor, not just the ones that we tested, but any other predictor, no other predictor could outperform this particular um, DRO predictor with KL and QD set. Okay, so. Now let's look at a more uh, interesting example maybe. So uh, second example is one where we um, have training samples that are generated by a homogeneous ergodic Markov chain with a finite state space. And usually Markov chains are encoded by the transition probability matrix, um, but it turns out that for our purposes, it's more convenient to define the parameter theta uh, that encodes the process as the probability mass function of two consecutive states in the Markov chain and actually asymptotically for large t. So we uh, also assume that all transition, uh, transitions in the Markov chain are actually possible with a positive, though perhaps small probability. Um, okay, so that means that uh, theta ij um, is strictly positive for every pair of, of, of states i and j. Now, the space of models in this case, so the space of all these um, doublet probability mass functions of two consecutive states uh, is given by the family of all d by d matrices with uh, the following properties. So first of all, all entries of these matrices need to be strictly positive. Then the sum of all entries needs to be equal to one, of course, because uh, theta needs to encode probability mass function of two consecutive states. And then the sum of the i throw needs to equal the sum of the i column for every i and the uh, corresponding sum needs to be, uh, well, is by, by construction equal to the to stationary probability of the Markov chain being in state, j, uh, state i. OK, so in this case, an estimator that we can use for this uh, uh, double, double distribution would be the empirical double distribution, which simply records the empirical frequencies of visiting the two states i and j in two consecutive periods. Um, that's quite natural to assume that we should work with this statistic. And actually, the empirical double distribution is again a sufficient statistic. Uh, this is again a consequence of the fischer neiman factorization theorem. And it also satisfies, again, a large deviation principle, but in this case, with a different rate function. It's no longer the kullback libor divergence, but in this case, it's the so called conditional relative entropy. So the definition of this is shown here at the, at the bottom of the slide. So this means that our theorem 2 applies again and implies that the, the distribution robust predictor, now with a conditional relative entropy and descent, centered at the empirical double distribution, 
does represent a Pareto dominant solution for the original meta optimization problem. Okay, so actually our results also apply when the observable data follows an autoregressive uh, Gaussian process with a continuous state space. And uh, so if the drift term is unknown, for example, we may use a scaled um, version of the sample mean as a natural estimator. And this estimator is not a sufficient statistic for the true theta, but it does satisfy a large deviation principle. And uh, therefore, our theorem one applies, and we can construct Pareto dominant solutions for the restricted meta optimization problem. If the um, autoregressive Gaussian process is scalar, so it's just a one dimensional process, and the autoregressive coefficient is unknown, then we may um, use, for example, the least squares estimator, but we could also use the so called Yule Walker estimator. And, and both of these actually satisfy a large deviation principle. Uh, though with different rate functions. And in fact, neither of them uh, are sufficient statistics. So that means in this case, we could again construct Pareto dominant solutions for two different versions of the restricted meta optimization problem um, because they're induced by two different uh, statistics that we, that we use. Okay, so as a last example, um, let's go back to IID processes, but in this case, um, let's assume that the distribution of the training samples there, they follow identical parametric distribution, uh, distribution families from, from the list shown here. And actually, I should point out that this list is, is not exhaustive, so there, there are many other distributions that would work. So, so yeah. So, for example, we could, we could look at uh, uh, training samples that follow normal distributions or exponential distributions or gamma, Poisson, and so on. Now, in all these cases, one can show that the sample mean is a sufficient statistic um, for, these, uh, for the parameters of these distributions and that it actually satisfies a large deviation principle. And the corresponding rate function, interestingly, is given by the convex conjugate of the log moment generating function of a single observation. So there's a nice connection to, to convex analysis here. And uh, we can therefore construct DRO predictors, the distribution robust predictors that represent Pareto dominant solutions for the original meta optimization problem uh, for all these uh, different kinds of, of data generating processes, uh, which is quite nice. And actually, many convex uncertainty sets that have been used in the literature, they could be constructed in this way and could be identified to be optimal for certain structures of IID processes. So, maybe not so surprisingly, right? Uh, elliptical uncertainty sets that have been used widely in robust optimization for. For, uh, for a long time, uh, these will be optimal for, um, for, for situations where the data is generated by, uh, by normally distributed uh, samples. Okay, so this brings me to the end of my talk. So I'd like to give you a, a summary and maybe draw some conclusions. So we've formulated a meta optimization problem. And the goal was in this problem to optimize over different surrogate optimization problems which are encoded or represented by um, data-driven predictors, which are the objective functions, and uh, which yields data-driven prescriptors, which are the, the optimal solutions. So yeah, so the, the meta-optimization problem is therefore an optimization problem over optimization problems. And it is designed to balance the in-sample risk, which is what we try to, to minimize the objective, versus the out-of-sample disappointment, which we try to control in the constraints. So we actually impose a constraint on the exponential decay rate of this out of sample disappointment as the number of samples increase. So the idea was that um, by solving such a problem, we would try to push down the in-sample risk and therefore implicitly the out of sample risk, which is the actual quantity of interest, simultaneously under all possible models and in, in particular, therefore, also under the unknown true model. We've seen that if we can solve the meta optimization problem, if it has a Pareto dominant solution, then it leads to a separation principle. So there will be a, a separation of estimation and optimization. So this separation principle holds if we can find a statistic theta and t that is sufficient for the unknown parameter, and that obeys a large deviation principle. And it, it actually turns out that both of these quantities are usually satisfied if uh, our distribution family is an, exponential, is an exponential family. That's something I didn't discuss, but that we discussed at length in the paper. And another thing that I didn't discuss is that this result is somewhat reminiscent of the um, well-known Raoul Blackwell theorem in statistics, uh, 
And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. So we've also seen that pre dominant solutions, if they exist, then they have a distribution, distribution robust interpretation. So they lead to a, a, a DRO model. And the ambiguity set of this distribution robust model is a, is a ball with respect to the rate function of the large deviation principle. And the center of the ball is just the, uh, the statistic theta t. The radius of the ball can be identified with the decay rate of the out of sample disappointment, which was a hyperparameter that was specified by the decision maker. Uh, there is another property that I did not show to you, but actually um, we have quite some degrees of freedom in specifying our statistic or our parameterization of the distribution family. And we can actually prove that our results are invariant under any homeomorphic transformations of these two, of these two uh, quantities. So that actually uh, is sort of a sanity check that, that indicates that what we're doing probably makes, makes some sense. So the, um, what, we, what we tried to achieve was actually to, to um, ensure data efficiency. So in some sense, our predominant solutions of meta-optimization problems, they're reminiscent of efficient estimators that have been studied in statistics under the name of uh, Bahadur efficiency. So this is a bit uh, a less well-known uh, concept than the, the usual um, efficiency concept for, for unbiased estimators, uh, which are called efficient if, the, uh, if a properly scaled um, covariance matrix of the estimator attains the, the inverse Fisher information uh, asymptotically. So here, Bahadur efficiency is a concept of uh, uh, which looks at not uh, asymptotically small errors of the estimators, but at constant errors, so large errors, and asks for the best possible decay rate of these errors. And there is a close connection to our uh, predominant solutions here. I should also point out that the, the results are in, uh, in some sense quite general. So they even hold for non-convex decision problems. We never use any convexity. And they uh, also hold for, for quite general class of data generating processes, so in particular for non iid data processes like mark of chains or ultra aggressive processes. So in some sense, the, uh, these results could, could serve as a justification for using distribution robust uh, models. And uh, yeah, the, so the shape of the ambiguity set depends on the data process. So basically we, we um, establish a connection that allows you to, to determine if you have a particular, um, if you know the structure of your data generating process, you may be able then to pick the, the best ambiguity set for that particular uh, structure. So there, I mean, many ambiguity sets have been proposed in the literature and uh, there's uh, been a, always a debate which one should be better than, than others. And, and I mean, there's a, is an attempt actually to bring some order into this uh, zoo of all different ambiguity sets. So at least some criterion by which you could choose an ambiguity set in a particular decision-making situation. And the radius of the ambiguity set is a nice physical interpretation. So one thing I did not talk about, and I would have ideally wanted to talk about in a, in a seminar on optimization, would be computation. So it turns out that um, these uh, Pareto dominant solutions is lead to new distribution robust optimization models with ambiguity sets that have also that have not yet been studied in the literature. And one example is the one um, that becomes optimal when we look at data generated by market chains. So in this case, the ambiguity set was a ball with respect to the so-called conditional relative entropy. Now it turns out that the, uh, the corresponding optimization model, so the one that optimized, that finds the worst case objective over this ambiguity set is a, is a non-convex optimization problem. And there is a need to, to come up with, with new algorithms for that. And actually, um, so, um, um, an excellent master student of mine has developed um, actually a Frank Wolf type method to solve, uh, to, to simplify this, this complicated non convex problem and uh, yeah, to try to, to solve it efficiently. So, this is, I think there's more research to be done and there are many more optimization problems that uh, should be studied. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. Then I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Here is a uh, just a list of the papers that uh, are most, most closely related to this talk. The one in the red frame is the, essentially the paper I've been uh, presenting, presenting, and uh, yeah, you can find the, the, the paper on the archive. Okay, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for a very nice, interesting talk. So, Manuel, first question. Thank you very much, Daniel, 
for this again very enlightening talk it's always a pleasure to listen to you so so inspiring thank you very much Maurice. so uh I have a question which may be related to the conclusions also, because I, at some point I thought that you the you construct the surrogate optimization model by use of a so, sort of statistics, theta hat, theta hat t, right? Yes. And this theta hat t need not be take values, uh, uh, single values, but could also be multi-valued, like in the uh, in the in the Markov chain example, where you have matrices. Yes, yes. Right? Usually it has but, the same dimension as the theta, and the theta is just yes, the parameter yeah, the theta, that we call It's a variable. choice of, of model which you regard as a theta. And my question now is, all of your models seem to have a functional or a multifunctional, finite dimensional valued functional of the empirical distribution function, of the distribution function based upon the observations. This is the only way they... Do your sample is in influencing your your choice or your, your your model, right? It's always uh, either it is the empirical mean or it's something similar. I, am, am I correct also for the for the Markov chain example? I'm not uh, sure. It is the empirical distribution of this um, two, two 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 steps consecutive states. You look at two consecutive the, states. So the, so I uh, think I am correct. Like the stationary so, distribution of two consecutive states. Yes. yes. So so it, this is a very and then uh, it's a very particular setting still. No, you what I was thinking is why a point estimator theta hat t. Why not a um, a set valued estimator, like for covering so, so, so confidence sets for, for parameter estimation in classical statistics, this is not point, but this is intervals or multi, well, in, in many dimensions, it can be very nice sets, but there's a full fully established theory. Does it lead somewhere else? Does it open up these uh, uh, chances you, you addressed of, of having more general um, uh, ambiguity sets? Or do, do we do we in other words do we need to deviate from this setting of a functional of the empirical distribution functions to get something really new? I mean everything is new, of course, and, and the connections are very important, particularly the, the Bahadur efficiency and the Rao Blackwell optimization principle. But but you were you were pushing me to this question basically with your conclusions and your yes. quest to, to no, push I mean, limits further. The, the purpose of the conclusions yeah. <laughs> and so in the end we have i mean we can construct optimal we can construct these optimal solutions for the meta optimization problems whenever we can find a statistic that satisfies these two properties. It, it must be sufficient for the unknown parameter and it must satisfy a large deviation principle. And if it does, we can, we can use that. And, and we, we found some examples where both of these properties are satisfied and these are the ones that I showed to you. And I mean, there are probably others. Um, so you point out that the estimates that that, that satisfies these, satisfy these properties, they often have uh, the form of looking like an empirical distribution or actually a sample mean. And this is true, actually. I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm in the best position to explain to you why that is, because in the end, yeah, the condition is just, they need to satisfy a large deviation principle and need to be a sufficient statistic. Turns out that, um, I, I did not discuss this in the talk, but from the paper, it's clear that we, uh, we often have this property when, uh, the, the distribution family from which we start is an exponential family. And uh, I think, I mean, that's, uh, that leads to beautiful results, but it's also, a, it, it is a restriction, right? So to have a sufficient statistic, there is probably no hope to find one if you're not in an exp exponential family. I've not seen a proof that this is not true, but uh, I think that's general consensus that people think this will only be possible in, in such a setting. I think, for, for many applications that there is, uh, the exponential families, they, they cover many interesting applications, but not every interesting application. And uh, yeah, well, I mean, this is certainly not the end of, of, of research. So in that sense, one needs to go beyond that. Uh, so in exponential families, usually the, the large deviation principle that applies uh, follows from this uh, 
Gamma Ellis theorem. So, so actually, all the, the results have, most of the results I've shown to you were special cases of the Gamma Ellis theorem, and, uh, which, which applies to, to exponential families. I, that's what I can say. I mean, otherwise, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very good observation that I make. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure why all these estimators look like they look. Thank you. Uh, just, just a follow-up question, but you don't need actually sufficiency in all your settings, no? You There were some examples so, that you could do without. Yes, so I had the two theorems, right? One of them, the first one, here I wanted to find Pareto dominant solutions that are optimal over all functions of the data. And then I had a restricted one where I had, uh, I had functions that depended on the data only indirectly through the statistic. And in the second setting, we can find, that's easier, we can find the predominant solution if we only find an, est um, an estimator that satisfies a large deviation principle, but may not be sufficient. In but this way, you build in, you build in this sufficiency by, by assumption in this restriction, no? Basically, you The sufficiency admit... just guarantees us the optimality over a much, much larger yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What are the questions? So I just have one question. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Daniel, for the nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I just wanted to have like a naive question. Is like, uh, so you concluded like the KL divergence provides the best uh, trade off, right? Uh, in that sense of uh, in sample and the disappointment rate. So like, is it also valid like when we have finite samples? And like we should always choose the KL divergence. So, so this is a this is a very sharp question uh, indeed. So the KL uh, set was optimal if we had IID data on a finite state space, right? And uh, this was the news vendor problem basically, right? And um, but you're you're completely right, right? We, we uh, the performance measures which we which we looked at were asymptotic, and there is no reason to believe that KL should be the best thing you do if if you have really only finitely many samples. I mean, to, to argue that our results still make sense, you may remember from the plots I've showed you from the numerical experiments that actually both the in-sample risk as well as the out-of-sample disappointment, they saturated very quickly. So the in-sample risk very quickly became constant and the out-of-sample disappointment was really pretty much aligned. So I think and of course, this was a small example. So at least there are some examples where I think it's perfectly fine to work with the asymptotic quantities. However, I can totally imagine that if you have a, um, a problem with, with uh, large dimensional uncertainty, which are the interesting problems, and uh, few data, and you just cannot drive the number of samples to infinity to uh, get into an asymptotic regime, that uh, actually something else may be optimal. And actually, and so, from, from experiments that my co-authors carried out, um, it seems like that the Wasserstein and the set might actually do better if you only find any many samples, but I have no, I have no theory for, for, for that. So that's something that needs to be further investigated. But it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent comment. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there other questions? So Daniel, uh, you mentioned this uh, numerical method that uh, you developed in the ISML paper. So what is here the point? The point is to, to generate the, let's say the whole Pareto curve or, uh, yeah, is this a, a different approach, a different idea? So, so okay, so we, we need to always be, always be careful. We have the meta optimization problem and, and, and this one we've solved because we have a closed form expression. The okay. solution of the meta problem is another optimization problem. Now, in the ICML paper, we, we wanted to solve numerically that other optimization problem, which even though we have it in closed form, solving it is, is difficult. And in the case of the uh, Markov chain data and Markovian data, here, the, the problem that evaluates the worst case of the objective runs over this, uh, this matrix of, of this double distribution. So if you have a, a Markov chain with D states, then we have D squared decision variables. So first of all, this, this problem grows quickly. And uh, the conditional relative entropy is non-convex. So, uh, so this is a non-convex optimization problem. In the, in the objective function, what we have is the, we need to evaluate the, 
the cost under the stationary distribution, which is just a marginal of this of this um, doublet distribution. And uh, so what this what my master student uh, Meng Meng Li, what she did it was very clever. So she decomposed this problem. So, so she developed a, a Frank Wolf method, which actually solves this problem by actually solving a sequence of much simpler problems, which are convex and only have dimension e instead of n squared. And uh, by exploiting problem structure, and, and this is guaranteed to converge very efficiently to a stationary point. And uh, actually, uh, in situations where the data is actually generated by a Markovian, uh, by a Markov chain, uh, we could demonstrate that actually you, you can get better results than if you just use a KL and beauty set by ignoring the Markovian structure, the zero dependence, and, and pretend that your data is IIN. Thank you. So are there other questions? Then we can stop here. Thank you very much, Daniel, for a very nice, very clear talk. So That's I'd like all. to thank the, the audience for, for attending our seminar today. So just want to, to say that the, the video and the slides will be posted on the website of the seminar. And the, the speaker next Monday will be Konstantin Zelnesko from the University of Yash. So I wish you a nice week. All the best. See you next Monday. Thank you, Daniel. Great Thank, you Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank Thanks bye. again for the invitation. Thank you. Bye. So uh, great audience. Uh, we have 130 people in the room today. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I told you an email. I was, I was afraid because I've given this talk before and I know that some people yes. have heard it. And, oh. and I, yeah, I thought it would have been nice also to prepare a new talk, but then the, the time limit was didn't make it possible okay. for me to, to come up with a new one. So, right. so this, this is great. I mean, everybody is kind of tired after many Zoom meetings and, and, and many, let's say, Zoom webinars, but uh, yeah, still. So today there was a kind of a certain enthusiasm. Yeah? Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> I think in Europe the weather helps, so it's uh, yes, <laughs> the first time in months that it feels like it's summer. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, indeed.